Good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 12062 Alternative Dispute Resolution. This is Week 2, Term 2018. And tonight we're following on from the introductory matters that we dealt with in terms of ADR generally. The first assessment requires you to register in groups of three or perhaps four. Failing that, you can find your own group members from outside the class. The reason that I encourage people to find members within the group is that you can assist each other. You can toss around ideas. You can collaborate in a meaningful and totally, totally lawful sense. If you choose, however, to use people external to the unit, perhaps studying different um, subjects at the university or not studying at, at all, that's fine. Just let me know. But I think it's an opportunity for you to engage with others. So that's why I'd prefer that even though this is an individual assessment as such, that you work with others in completing your task. For the first assessment, you need to act as a mediator or a conciliator. I take it that we now know the difference between the two and you have a clear idea at this stage as to which way you're going to go for your assessment. If not, please make your choice this week. You should also now have your scenario either in complete form or at least close to complete form. You should know the area of the dispute. Family law, criminal law, franchise, partnership, neighbours, whatever it is, you should have the idea of that and you should have the basic facts for the dispute and put that in dot point form. Run that by the people that you're working with in the assessment just to get their ideas and perhaps they can operate as a sounding board for you. You should also be looking to allocate your um, partners in the assessment in a, in a loose sense their role in the dispute. People should now be volunteering. Well, I'll be, um, I'll be this person. I'll be the company director. Um, uh, do you want to be the employee? Whatever it is. So start to have the dispute well fleshed out, discuss it with your working partners and have them th start to think about their role as part of uh, in the dispute, which is not accessible but of course, the more that you can furnish for them in terms of detail and ideas, the better the job they can do to help you to showcase your skills. So forward preparation now is critical. What, what I do find each year, and I've run this assessment for a, for a little while now, is that the better prepared people are, the better the job will be. Don't leave it to the last minute. You need to start your task with an opening statement. Either a mediator or conciliator will need to have an opening statement. Now this is essentially to camera. And for the sake of the exercise, you'd probably want the opening to run for, I don't know, three to five minutes, maybe a little further. Can anyone give me some ideas using the chat facility or unmuting the microphone as to some of the things that you think a mediator or a conciliator should mention in their opening statement? So let's see if we can get some ideas going. Any thoughts? Um, that, that they're independent to the yes, parties? Independence is a very good way to, um, you, you need to establish that you are independent as a professional um, ADR practitioner. Thank you, Lisa, that's excellent. In the meantime, Craig has um, said, set a uh, talk about the process. Monique says the ground rules and the time frame. Amanda says, explain the format of the mediation. And Jackie says, explain your role. All of those things and the contribution by Lisa are, are all correct. So, you should be making notes of these things. So what else do you want to tell them? What are some other dot points that you think would be useful? Ah, Jackie says confidentiality, excellent. So we now know that you need to explain to the parties the ground rules, the time frame, the fact that you are independent, 
um, uh, that you've had no prior conf contact, or if you have, to what extent, that it's a confidential process, that the mediator is not the decision maker, says Amanda, that's excellent. So you're saying, look, I'm not here as a judge or as a jury, but my role is to assist you. I mentioned last week that part of your job is to ensure that the parties retain ownership of the dispute. So why not say that? Why not make an acknowledgement during the statement of the opening that you understand that this is a dispute between the parties, but it is important that they understand this is their dispute. And I'm not here to take away the dispute. And in fact, quite the opposite, as the ADR practitioner, I want you to take control of the dispute. Jackie says, you're there to try to achieve a mutually agreed outcome. Excellent. And I think a good way of doing that is to say something to the effect that you hope that the parties can work towards a resolution of the dispute. It may not be a resolution that you have in mind now. It may not be something that you're entirely happy with. However, as a rule of thumb, if both parties walk away with an agreement and both are perhaps a little dissatisfied, it's probably about right. That's a rule of thumb. But remember, of course, the benefit of waking up the next day, knowing that this dispute is now behind you, that you've resolved the dispute and you can get on with other things in your life. Following on from what Jackie said about confidentiality, she has added, and I think quite rightly, that the process is without prejudice. Being confidential is one thing, without prejudice is another, but they're allied concepts. So what do we mean by without prejudice? Can anyone tell me what that is? We've heard it before, but what does it actually mean? I'll get you to unmute. Yes, Dakota. Do you want to tell us about without prejudice? No, Dakota doesn't. How about you, Jackie? Do you want to give it a shot? No. Anyone? Hi, yes. Nicholas, I'll, yes, I'll Nicholas. jump in and have a crack. Um, Thank I, you. I read something about the fact that anything that's discussed um, during that session is not prejudicial and cannot be used against the individual in a court um, or a court process. Um, I think unless there is some really strenuous circumstances like acts of potential violence or harm or something to that effect. Yeah, that's very much along the, the lines. Thank you very much for that, Nicholas. And sorry, thank, I had problems on muting my mic. That was the oh, problem, is that, sorry. Is that why we couldn't hear from <laughs> yeah, you? Sorry. Thank you, Jackie. Is there anything you want to add to what Nicholas uh, said? So I was just going to say in our scenario, because if people are not aware, I am a conciliator. I do around 13 conciliations a week for the Fair Work Commission. So that's how I was adding all those things, because I do an opening statement every day. Okay. Um, <laughs> obviously. Um, yeah, so look, so and what we say is it is without prejudice. So any discussions we do have are private and confidential to the actual conciliation. So any concessions made or any offers put by any party um, are only subject to that conciliation. Or if we get an agreement, obviously subject to terms of settlement. If it goes on to hearing, any discussions we've had are not discussed with the commissioner. Excellent. Thank you, Jackie. Sorry. No, I appreciate that. And Jackie, if you don't mind, um, shortly I might have a special task for you if you're willing to accept the challenge. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's uh, giving us a dry run, giving us a, an overview. Um, Neil says that without prejudice talks about what is said between the parties will not be relied upon later in court proceedings. Okay, so we've covered a few things here. We've talked about the role that you have to play as a mediator or conciliator. We've talked about the ground rules and the time frames. We've talked about not having previous contact with the parties, or if we have, the extent to which we've had contact with those parties. We've talked about the role of the mediator or conciliator as being a person who is not there as a decision maker. You are in control of the process, but you're not there to decide a resolution of the dispute. 
and in fact quite the opposite. We're there to acknowledge the concerns and assist the parties to retain ownership of their dispute. In terms of the process, we want to tell them um, about what happens after you make this opening statement. We'll come back to that about the process. We've talked about the process being without prejudice, meaning essentially that statements made during the course of the mediation or conciliation cannot be used in later proceedings or disclosed to a decision maker, as Jackie quite rightly pointed out, um, following the event. You want to retain that independence and that confidentiality as far as um, the information is concerned. There are some reasons why you'd want to encourage the parties to embrace the without prejudice concept because there are some clear advantages. And we talked about confidentiality generally, um, unless, and I think this was Nicholas pointed out, uh, there are an exception or there are exceptional circumstances such as the existence of threats having been made during the course of the mediation or conciliation. But there are a couple of things that I want to flesh out there. The first is the process. Now, what can you tell me under the heading of process, what can you tell me will occur after the mediator or conciliator makes an opening statement? What happens next? And I'm talking process. Nicholas says, during the process, choose your questions carefully, open or close to help guide the discussion, clarify the positions of all parties without emotional overtones by using reframing. That's excellent. And that gets more into the next session about the techniques that you use during the course of the um, joint uh, discussions. Monique says, one of the parties makes their opening statement. I think that makes sense. So what you explain during the course of your opening statement when describing the process is to say, when I've completed this, I am then going to invite both parties to make an opening statement, one at a time. Should you ask the parties to limit their opening statement to a time frame? What are the advantages and disadvantages of doing that? Any thoughts? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Monique, okay. yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I would I would be oh, I would not be inclined to limit them to a time frame, but limit them in terms of the facts and issues rather than the peripheral matter. Okay, so don't, don't be overly directive, but ensure that the parties remain focused in terms of the key issues. Yeah. All right. We had a similar thought from Amanda who says, um, by limiting, by providing a time, it doesn't give the parties the chance to have their say. Um, perhaps a different, slightly different approach. Bill says, it does force them to get to the point. And Jackie, um, does refer to limitations because of practical aspects. Lisa, can I just start? Sorry, can I just add though? Because um, I can't type quickly enough and I'm on my phone. Um, look, the reason that we do that is because of the time limitations. However, it's down to individual conciliators and you do know when someone's ready to move on. So we do give that, them that time. For some people, it's the first time they've actually talked to the employer since the dismissal. So it's really important if you want to try and get a really good outcome, sometimes it's really important, important to let them talk and run slightly over time. Yes, absolutely. So don't be too critical. And again, within the spirit of trying to encourage the parties to retain ownership of the dispute, you don't necessarily want to be too directive. Lisa says in family law matters, often emotion speaks more than the real issues. And Monique says that some people might take a while to be able to get their issues out. My personal view is that I don't limit the time. It's not, I don't think that's necessarily the right answer. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. Um, but I, I do encourage the parties to remain focused during that period of time. And I might give 
depending on the nature of the dispute, and you'll have some good idea of the dispute, I might give them some some guidelines. Um, you know, sometimes I will will ask them if they could make their opening within a period of um, say five or ten minutes, or maybe even less, depending on the dispute. Now, in your case, for the assessment purposes, it is a short form mediation or conciliation, so it, it would be perhaps even more appropriate given the, the very strict time constraints that you have, that you do that. All right, so again, within the context of the inform or the process, we've identified that it's probably appropriate, I think very appropriate, to announce to the parties that after you've completed your opening statement, you will invite them in turn to make their opening statement. We've talked about whether or not we should limit their time, Craig says, well, how do you choose who opens first? Well, what do you think? Craig, do you have a view? Does anyone else have a view? Who do you think should go first? Is there a rule that applies here? Uh, John, it's Nicholas. I'd say it's pretty hard for a respondent to um, answer to what the issue is unless they've actually heard what the issue is from the complainant first. So my suggestion would be that the person that's raised the complaint would probably um, go first, or the applicant, and then whoever um, you know is responding to that goes second. That makes a lot of sense to me, as it does to a number of your colleagues. So as you were speaking, Nicholas, people were making comment. Um, Amanda said, party that makes the claim. Jackie says the applicant. Bill says the one who raised the dispute and Neil the applicant slash claimant. So I think that makes some sense in general terms. Um, certainly it's, it's usually the approach I adopt. Um, okay, so um, do you encourage parties, do you set some degree of ground rule about intervention or comment whilst a party is making their opening statement? Do we need to do that? Should we do that? Yes. No interruptions, to be more specific, says Kate. I think that's a good rule. Allow them to speak? Yes. So even though it's their dispute, you're maintaining control of the process, and I think it's entirely appropriate, in fact, I think necessary to say, whilst a party is making a, an opening statement, please, Listen carefully and no interruptions, because listening carefully is very important. If you wish to say something as a result of what you've heard, just make a note of it while the other party is speaking, just a few words to prompt you, to remind you what it is that you want to say. Okay, so we've identified that the parties will make their opening statements, likely without interruption from the other, one after the other, and what happens then? Once the parties have made their opening statement, so everyone's now had a chance to have a say within a relatively quick period, what's the next thing you think would happen logically in a mediation or conciliation? Do we go straight to the agreement? I don't think so. Coming up with some options. Yes, coming up some with, with some options, although we might be jumping the gun a little bit. I had in mind coming up with something else, and Craig's onto it. He's read my mind here. Craig, what, what do you think? Oh, you're sorry, sorry Anthony. You? No, you're right, Anthony. What do you, what do you I think? Said, yeah. Um, I'd like to suggest they identify the issues at which they're at loggerheads because they might spout off and say lots of stuff but only a portion of it is actually a dispute. Exactly, thank you very much, Anthony. And that is exactly what Craig had suggested. That what we're looking to do at that stage after both parties have made their opening statements is I think to identify the issues and identify the real issues here. Um, there may be lots of things that people say, but they may not necessarily be issues. And it's a little like pleadings. Those of you that have undertaken um, civil procedures, uh, of course, unit will know about the pleadings where we try to identify the real issues in dispute and we talk about the material facts that are um, 
uh, raised in the pleadings to support an argument about those issues. So what we want to do is identify the issues and the way in which we do that is we create a document. Now when I say we, I really mean the mediator or the conciliator. It's a very short document, typically, but this is the way I like to operate. So as the parties are, are going through their opening statements, as the mediator or conciliator, you're writing down some key words, aren't you? Key words that you think go to the heart of the issues in dispute. Now, sometimes you get a match. You get the same words or phrase being used by both parties. Um, there might be words like, and Jackie can elaborate on this later, but there might be words like wages. You might pick up on words like overtime. You might pick up on words like work conditions. You know, those sorts of things. Um, in a neighbourhood dispute, there might be words like noise or smoke or smell or whatever it might be. Okay, so you're looking as the ADR professional to identify words. Now, what do we want to do with those words that we've heard after the parties have both presented their opening statement? What are we looking to do? We're looking to create a document. What type of document? Ah, Jackie. So you're an unfair advantage on this one, Jackie, aren't you? But you're right, spot on, the exact word that I was after. Does everyone see what Jackie said? Agenda. So the reason we have an agenda, the reason I encourage you as an ADR practitioner to create an agenda is that it enables you to maintain control of the process, but also to focus the party's attention on the real issues. Generally, as a rule of thumb, generally I would say somewhere around three or four items on an agenda would be ideal. It can be one, that's pretty rare I should think. It can be five or six, but if you have too many items on an agenda, um, it's probably becoming a little more complex. Sometimes I cheat, sometimes I have four items on an agenda, and then I might have two or three sub items per item on the agenda. Kind of, you can get around it that way. But um, some form of agenda, Gen generally speaking, if you can have one word or one phrase for the, each item of the agenda, that's ideal. So what do you do with that? Once you've, in your mind as the ADR practitioner, you've come up with an, an agenda. Three items that you think are important. You know, in a parenting matter, it might be schooling, number one, religion, number two, and something else, number three. So what do you think, Lisa? Um, would you ask the parties, would you say, from listening to both of you speak, I believe these are the main issues and just getting their, um, I guess, their feedback that you are on track to what their issues are? That's excellent. And Craig raised the same issue. Obtain agreement from the parties as to the agenda. That's excellent. And I like the way that you framed, you phrased that, Lisa, as well. What you're then doing is you, you're actually creating a few things. Firstly, you're maintaining control of the process. You are encouraging the parties to take control of the dispute because they have a say in the agenda items. Typically, the agenda is a written document. It's not just verbalised. I like to write it. People have different approaches to this. Some people like to use a whiteboard. That's, that's a good approach. So that you've got something that parties can look at. I tend to write something on a piece of paper, but not in small print. I'll print in quite large print, and it might be the three items, and I'll put it on the middle, in the middle of the um, table. It gives the parties a chance to focus on something. And I like to have them agree on, uh, on something in the sense that now they've agreed on an agenda and they're both looking at a document and it starts to get them within a mindset of looking to come to an agreement. Okay, so we've got our agenda. We've got agreement from the parties as to the agenda. 
it, that also serves another purpose down the track because what happens if you're three hours into a mediation session, you feel as though you are likely, the parties are likely to resolve the issue and out of nowhere, one of the parties raises a brand new issue. What it gives you a chance to do is bring them back to the agenda and say that these are the things that we're here to discuss because it can easily go off the rails at a later stage. Okay, so we've got, we've had our openings. We've created our agenda with the agreement of the parties. What happens there next? And this is all part of the process. And, and just to recap, what we're doing now is we're going through the process so that you can explain the process to the parties in your opening statement. So what happens next in the process typically? What do we do then? What do you think happens? One-on-one -on -one sessions, says Amanda. Some mediators and uh, conciliators do that. They'll go into a private session um, at that stage. I tend not to, um, but some people do. So I can't, I can't say it's wrong. It's just not my preferred pr approach. Option generation, says Jackie. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're in what, what I like to call the joint session. So now we're encouraging the parties to talk. And in the process of talking, we're asking them to identify the issues of concern to them, perhaps in more detail, to come up with some ideas and generate some options. Anything else that you're looking to do, uh, have the parties do at that stage? It's a great way of the parties to better understand the other's position. And we'll talk over the weeks about the techniques that you can use as the ADR practitioner. You're looking for common ground. I think that's an excellent thing. Trying to get some sort of common ground agreement at the start is a good way of having the parties um, continue to talk with each other. So can we both agree about this aspect? And the key is to get the parties to talk to each other, says Jackie, and I entirely agree. What you may find is that from the outset, there's a lot of emotion and you may need to engage in some emotion control. You know, sponging is one of the techniques we'll talk about. But irrespective of the level of emotion, people tend to talk to you. Even though you've said, look, I'm not here as the decision maker, I'm not here to determine who's right and who's wrong, they will still want to raise their case. They'll want to raise their arguments with you. And whilst you may allow that to occur for a while, as quickly as you reasonably can, I think you want to ask them to redirect their attention to each other. Part of the reason for doing so is to ensure the parties are aware that this is, as you say, this is their dispute. So you're looking for them to dispute directly with you there to assist and facilitate. So as Jackie quite rightly says, try to get the parties to talk to each other, try to re-establish some degree of communication. Um, Christopher says, have the parties begin seeing solutions rather than conflict. That's excellent. So part of option generation and brainstorming we'll talk about is to encourage the parties to come up with some ideas to resolve the matter, but talk to each other. All right, so what typically might happen after this, what I've called a joint session? And I'll give a hint, Amanda alluded to this earlier when she said one-on-one -on -one sessions. What do we call those one-on-one -on -one sessions? We can call them one-on-one -on -one sessions, there's nothing wrong with that. Are there any other, other words that we use to describe that? Breakout, says Craig. Jackie's got the answer that I'm looking for. Private sessions or private meetings. Not exactly a shuttle, but it's like a shuttle, but not quite. So 
what happens typically in a mediation conciliation is after the opening statements, after the agenda has been created, after the first joint session, you might break into private sessions. And during those private sessions, uh, anything which is discussed between the parties and you as the ADR professional remains with you and confidential to you, not to be disclosed to the other party without the other parties, without the disclosures, specific consent and direction to do so. I'll come back to that. So in a private session, it is a one-on-one -on -one, to use Amanda's terminology. It is a breakout, if you like, to use Craig's terminology. It is a private session. I like the, the idea of private session. So typically in a private session, people will start to just relax and basically they're looking for you for some guidance, but they're also starting to uh, think about what the other side have said and they may wish to articulate some options or disclose some, some concerns that they've got or deficiencies in their case. So in the private sessions, you've got a great idea. You've got a, an opportunity to get some insight into the way they're traveling and the way they're thinking. I quite often start a private session with something like, you've done really well so far. How are you traveling? How are you feeling about this mediation or this conciliation? Um, you will then meet with the other side in a private session. And during the private sessions, I think you want to try, you, the private sessions, you want to try and keep them roughly the same time so that there's not a feeling that one party is being advantaged or disadvantaged over the other and that you're maintaining this fair-mindedness. Um, Amanda says, should you have the private session with the claimant first or not? That's a really good question. And I don't have a hard and fast rule on this. If anything, I probably would go more with the respondent, but there's no, no rule on this. And I'd be interested as to what Jackie does in terms of her practice. But um, I don't think there's a, a specific rule. And you can do that as you go. Jackie says the applicant. So, um, and that's fine. So have the private sessions, but make sure that you remind them uh, that anything that is said during the private session remains confidential as between you and them unless they authorise and direct you to sit, tell the other side. Look, even if they do want me to say something to the other side, I resist. And the reason I resist is that I don't want to become in a situation where I'm a broker ferrying offers from one to the other, because very quickly it will then develop into something like a shuttle, to use some terminology that Bill raised earlier. And there's nothing wrong with shuttle mediations per se, but... I don't encourage shuttle mediations because it does have the dynamic of taking the dispute away from the parties and you want to allow the parties to retain and take ownership of their own dispute. A shuttle mediation is a mediation where effectively the parties are in separate rooms, they're not having direct contact with each other and you as the ADR practitioner goes from one to the other. It's a little bit like uh, those of you that have bought or sold real estate, a little bit like the way in which a real estate agent will go from one to the other and, you don't, and, and there's not an encouragement for you to directly meet. Um, so that's a shuttle mediation. So after you've had the private sessions, what do you think happens then? You've had private sessions with both sides. What are you going to do typically then in a mediation session or a conciliation? Any thoughts? All right. So come back together, says Amanda. Another joint session, says Kate. Excellent. And that's your opportunity generally for the parties to communicate offers to each other. I encourage them to do that directly and hopefully come to a resolution. Um, so and that would be in a three-hour mediation session, you're probably coming back into that um, joint session somewhere in the two to two and a half hour range after um, uh, you've been through the, the earlier statements. So when it comes, now let's go back to the opening statement. Let's go back to what it is that you're going to say to the parties about the process. What you need to do is have some way of summarizing that in a way that makes sense to you that you can explain to the parties and do that as part of your opening. Um, 
I, I wanted to also expand on the issues to do with without prejudice. Now, in the opening statement, we identify that you need to tell the parties that this is a without prejudice process. What you want to do is say to the parties that anything that they say uh, during the session can't be used in later proceedings. But literally, is that anything that they say can't be used in later proceedings? Or do we really mean some things that you say can't be used in later proceedings? What do you think? So we're talking about you explaining this without prejudice concept during your opening statement. John, would it be um, like admissions or particular offers that can't be um, used? Because the general facts and issues are things that are going to be repeated because they're the essence of the matter. Exactly. If it's material that's common ground, it's in the material already, it's in the pleadings, for example, or it's um, within an employment contract, uh, there are issues that are going to be raised in a trial. You're absolutely right, Monique. So the main purpose of um, advising the parties about the confidential, without prejudice, if you like, nature of the proceedings is that you want to encourage the parties to make offers, to engage in some form of compromise with a view to coming up with novel solutions and in the knowledge that anything that they say by way of an offer or a compromise in an, a genuine attempt to settle is not something that can be later raised against them by the other party in a trial. So that's the real issue as to why we um, talk about without prejudice and what it really means in, conf in um, practice. Okay, so hopefully you've all made some notes um, as to what I think are the key issues for inclusion in introductory comments by a mediator or conciliator. I will usually start by introducing myself, advise if they didn't already know this, that I've been appointed by the parties themselves or pursuant to the terms of a contract or by the commission or by the tribunal or by the uh, mediation advisor or whoever it might be that appointed. I genuinely thank them for, for attending. Try to break the ice just a little bit and in confirm that I've had no previous contact with the uh, other parties. I generally ensure that the parties have authority to settle. What we don't want is a situation where down the track, almost at the death, three hours down the track, you're about, you think you've got an agreement, and then one of the parties says, well, of course, I don't have authority to make the agreement, so I'll have to run all this by my boss tomorrow. Um, that is disappointing because you need to establish that the parties that are there have the authority to make the decisions and hopefully sign the agreement. If not, perhaps consider some form of mechanism to enable that to occur during the session rather than having uh, hanging over for a later day. Um, and sometimes I'll ask the parties if they prefer first names or not. So they're just a few other things that um, I like to consider. Can anyone else think of other issues that they think a mediator or conciliator should say in the opening statement to explain the process or otherwise? Is there anything that we've missed? Um, I like to want to have meetings at work with people who are not in from inside the organisation. I like to talk about, you know, where the bathrooms are. Um, do you need to go and put money in your parking meter? You know, this is how long we expect to be here. Is there anything that's going to interrupt you today? Um, and talk about technology such as phones and those sorts of things, which should be turned off for the, um, for the process. Excellent. So practicalities are important. And I do um, specifically say that I anticipate the process will take, say, three hours and say, do you have any time constraints? And it's surprising. Sometimes people say, oh, I thought this was only going to take 10 minutes. Others thought, oh, three hours, I thought it might take longer than that. Um, so those sorts of practical issues are important. And likewise, the bathrooms, the breaks, um, you know, give them an idea of where they can get tea and coffee or whatever. So excellent contribution, Monique. Thank you. Um, Bill has raised a good point, and, and that is, are there any language issues that we need to consider um, or other communication barriers? So thank you for that. Jackie says, 
ah, this is really important, what will happen at the end of the process? In other words, what can the parties expect? Will there be a terms of settlement? And explain to the parties what happens if it doesn't settle. So where do we go from here? They're all good things for, introduc uh, for the introductory comments as well. All right, is there anything else? John, just out of yes, curiosity, do you have a, um, a dot point template that you would use for this process yourself? Oh, yes. Whether I disclose it or not, it's a different thing. But yes, I do. Um, but I'd encourage you to create your own based on what we've said. If you're really stark, I can give you mine, but it's very basic. And there's nothing, there's nothing that we've, in my document, that we haven't discussed tonight. So if you've made notes, you can rearrange the notes in a way that works for you. The reason I say it's got to work for you is you're the one that will be selling this. You're the one that will be saying these introductory comments in your mediation session and conciliation. So it's got to be a dot point work uh, format that works so that you can perhaps glance at it and continue in terms of fluency. Um, but if you really, if you really want to, I could maybe provide it, but I'd like everyone to create their own, if that's all right, Nicholas. No, that's fine, John. I just thought I'd throw it out there. You know what I'm like. You never ask, you never know. Thank you very um, much for that. Yes. One other quick question. We, we were talking a, a few minutes back about um, what can be disclosed and what's not disclosed in the context of um, what's spoken um, to the mediator or facilitator. If you get into a position where one party is literally refusing to negotiate or um, you get to a point where one party is offering options and the other party is just flatly knocking them down continuously like stubborn bull, they've got to have it their own way or no way, um, which I've been a party to <laughs> at times, not the bull, the, I've been on the other end of it. Um, what do you do then when, when the process breaks down? Because you can't use any of that information in a court, obviously. But how is the court to know that the mediation was unsuccessful due to the complete unwillingness of one party? Well, there, actually, there are some exceptions. And um, you've raised an interesting point. Well, the first is that we will talk during the unit more about techniques for overcoming difficulties. And probably next week, I'll start to talk about some of those things. And, and you'll hear acronyms such as WATNA and BATNA. What's the worst alternative to a negotiated agreement? What's your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? We'll talk about reframing skills, summarising skills, detoxification, sponging. So there's a lot of different techniques. And I'll talk about a toolkit where you, as an ADR practitioner, you dive into your toolkit to bring out one of these um, tools in order to deal with difficult personalities or roadblocks or whatever it might be. So in short, we'll be discussing a lot of those uh, things down the track in this unit. But immediately, you've raised an issue that I haven't got on my notes that will be relevant, particularly in something like family law disputes. So for those of you that I'm not a family law dispute resolution practitioner, but many people are, and I used to be prior to the grandfathering clauses. And anyway, it's a history I, I chose not to continue on, but I should have. Um, but there are the rules under, is it Section 60 of the Family Law Act, where um, in a family law dispute, if a party doesn't genuinely attempt to settle, then the certificate may go against them. So there are some circumstances where the failure for a party to engage or to engage appropriately may be lawfully disclosed and may be used against that party in later proceedings. So that's in the family law context. There may be other contexts where that will happen as well. So that's a really interesting point. Thank you, Nicholas. It's all right. You know me, I like to throw the cat amongst the pigeons. No, that's John. good. No, no, I'm, I'm pleased that you did. Jackie, I sort of alluded at the start that you might want to give us a, a bit of a dry run, a bit of a demo. I know that's putting you on the spot. <laughs> that's okay. Would, would, you, would you like to do that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> if, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. Yeah. 
So um, I was just jotting down some of my stuff from my opening <laughs> statement. I should know by heart, given that I do it three times a day. But <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I understand. So I hope you don't mind doing that. Normally I do. No, that's true. Normally I wrap no, no, up the session fine. with a dry run, but I think it would be better if it came from you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so look, just to give context, um, I do conciliations and mediations, predominantly conciliation in the unfair dismissal space. We generally leave the mediations for anti-bullying matters because that's about re-establishing communication, whereas unfair dismissals are usually about closure of relationship most of the time. So it is a slightly different process. So I'll do, given that I do mostly conciliations, I'll do that. So um, ours are mostly on the phone. Um, the only time that we do face-to-face -face really with unfair dismissals are if there's an interpreter involved. Okay. So, and just apologize for my accent if people can't understand me because I'm obviously lovely. a wee bit nervous now. <laughs> it's a lovely so. accent and don't be nervous, but... Uh, okay. Well, so you, I'll Mr. pretend that you're the, I'll pretend, John, that you're the employee, the applicant. Okay. 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 So um, just to give you a, a little bit of context before I start, um, I would contact the applicant via telephone and the representative, try to establish a little bit of rapport. Um, find out if they're ready to do the conciliation. Do they have any questions of me? Um, explain to them that I'm just going to put them, them on hold while I contact the respondent. And the next time they hear from me, it'll be in joint session. And I would do the same for the respondent as well. So just again, trying to get some communication flow before we even start, okay? So, so I'll say, um, so good afternoon or good evening, everyone. So we're now in joint session. So as I said, my name is Jackie Harvey and I'm a conciliator with the Fair Work Commission. So this is a conciliation conference relating to an application for um, an unfair dismissal, an alleged unfair dismissal made to the Fair Work Commission under Section 394 of the Fair Work Act. So on the phones today, we have John Milburn who made the application and for the respondent, we have John Smith, who's the managing director. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit now about my role. And sorry, I would have, in private session, established first names is okay. I should have said that, sorry. We're already at that stage. Um, so I just want to ex take a couple of minutes now just to explain my role. So my role as a conciliator is impartial. I'm not here to listen to all the evidence today, and it's not my role to decide who is right or wrong. I'm not here to provide legal advice, but I will provide you with guidance around what may happen if you don't reach an agreement today. The conciliation can't be recorded. These discussions are confidential, so any discussions we do have need to be kept confidential unless you need to seek professional advice or there's a legal requirement to disclose the information. The discussions are without prejudice, so any concessions made or offers made by you will not be used against you to later hearing. So we have around one and a half hours set aside today, and during that time, each of you will have the opportunity to share your side of the matter. Once both parties have had an opportunity to talk, we'll break into private sessions where I'll be asking each of you how you wish to move forward with a view to reaching an agreement today. If you are able to reach an agreement today, the terms of settlement will be confirmed with you. If you're unable to reach an agreement today, the matter will be referred to a member who will then make a determination on the evidence before them. Um, so then I would probably just go into talking about thank you very much for all the submissions that you've made just to confirm with the applicant that you received a copy of the F3 which is the employer response then I'll talk about the ground rules now the reason that I do that last is so that it is foremost in everyone's mind before we move into opening statements so what I would generally say is um, okay thanks very much everyone so I just so today is an informal process we'll try and keep it that way if we can however I would ask you to be polite and respectful in any discussions and I would ask for no interruptions and for no talking over each other, please. Then I would say, um, so John, you're the applicant, you made the application to the Fair Work Commission, so we're going to start with you. Would you like to briefly outline your perspective for us? Thank you very much. And that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Jackie. I appreciate that and I appreciate that I put you totally on the spot, but you did magnificently, so thank you. Um, all right, so Jackie's given you an excellent overview of an introduction for in a workplace context and that process can change slightly in terms of other issues, um, say family law. All right, so are there any questions about 
the opening statement and the process for mediations or for conciliations. And uh, Nicholas is saying, thanks heaps, Jackie. That was great, which it was. Thank you. So are there any questions? Any comments? All right. So clearly from tonight, you should have advanced further or during this week, advance further and ensure that you have your notes ready and practice the notes. Speaking of the groups and the assessment, I'm just going to share the screen for a moment. Hopefully this will succeed. What I want to do is um, uh, identify the group members as they appear. So hopefully you can see an extract of what I've been put placing in Ucru and Moodle. So as at today, that's my take on the groupings and um, all but one is in, uh, in confirmed. Um, there are others who aren't yet in groups. So please um, take this opportunity to find other people with whom you can work and let me know. Preferably an email and when you send an email, please ensure that you CC your colleagues in on that email so that I can respond by one click to all three of you. Um, if you are struggling to find other members within the class, as I mentioned, you can bring in outside parties. You don't have to tell me who they are. I'll just put external party or something to that effect. Okay, are there any questions about what we've discussed tonight? We've got a whole lot more that we'll be discussing during this unit. Um, have a look at the rubric in terms of how this um, unit is going to be assessed. Look, I will just leave you tonight with a comment that I made to students probably last year in terms of general feedback about their work in assessment one. And I'll just read it. Hi all, after reviewing the videos for the first assignment, I think it is appropriate to discuss oral presentation. I believe that in practice, you should draw upon your acting skills to some degree that requires you to regulate your voice. Typically, the mistakes that I see relate to the speed at which people speak, too fast usually, the absence of tone, variety in their voice, a pitch that is too high, a raised inflection at the end of a sentence and the use of fillers, ums and ahs. Think about these things and develop a style that will assist you to become more persuasive in your oral advocacy. There is no particular dress code for the recording or in practice. However, I think the nature of the dispute will guide you in your decision. In practice, I would almost always wear a suit and tie or coat and tie. Given the time constraints, I would think it unlikely that you would have time to enter private sessions. If you can, well and good but there's no need to force the issue. That said, I would expect that you would explain private sessions during your opening statement. I also expect that you would not likely secure an agreement during such a short mediation. You gain no extra marks if the matter settles. All right, so they were just some comments that I provided to students by way of general feedback following this assessment last year. I hope that provides you with some guidance as to the way I'm thinking this year. So uh, any questions further about the assessment, please feel free to ask now or um, by general questions through you crew. So before we wrap it up, are there any questions, comments, further contributions? All right. Well, sorry, thank you. John. Yes, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's yes, Monique. Monique. Um, in those comments you just um, you read, you mentioned that you wouldn't expect us to undertake private sessions, but last week you said that you would like us to. I just want to confirm this year's expectations, please. Yes, look, it, there's no clear expectation. Um, I don't necessarily expect that you'll have time to do private sessions. In other words, I don't want you to necessarily feel that you've got to force the issue. If you've explained private sessions, that would be fine in your opening statement. If naturally enough it goes into private sessions, well and good, um, but you don't have to. And I'm sorry that's vague, Monique, and I, and I do want to be consistent about it, but I hope that's explained it reasonably well. 
Oh, it has. I may have misunderstood last week. I just uh, wanted to clarify. Thanks for that. No, you probably didn't misunderstand, <laughs> so, but thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your patience. All right, any other questions? And thank you for that question, Monique. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, just a quick one from me, John. How long do you expect each of these videos to go? Because one of the uh, issuance that many of are going to have, um, and you know me with an IT background, it's probably not so much of an issue, but a lot of the free um, recording software that you can use, e.g. Zoom, if you have a free account, the maximum time frame they give you per session per day is 40 minutes. So if you've got three people that have to do a recording and you can only do maximum per day 40 minutes per person, um, some of us are going to probably have to record these different days for each person and then find the appropriate software to join them all together if you want them in one video. So that's an issue that some people may have to overcome. So I'm just wondering about how long a video. Um, I'm really pleased you raised that issue. So let me, let me clarify first that even though you're working together, my expectation is that you record your own session as a standalone. So it may be, for example, Nicholas, that you go first, you record your session where you're the mediator and upload that. But once you've completed your session, you stop and you essentially reconvene, start another session. But on the second occasion, it might be Darcy, who is the mediator, recording a session. And the third session might be, say, Amanda. But they're all separate sessions, even though you might do them on the same day and you might do them with the same people, you know, within different roles. Um, hopefully, then, that will fit within that time con constraint of, say, 40 minutes. I think the assessment task requires you to do a recording of up to... Can anyone remind me? Was it 25 minutes? 20 minutes? Is that what I put? All right. 25, yeah. I'm, I'm a little flexible on that, but the idea is that uh, I think one at one stage I said unlimited and I was getting mediations for hours, which um, was just too much. So it's a short form. Um, and that's why... I um, say don't don't force it. If you can do a private session, fine. If that flows naturally enough, but you don't have to have a private session. I hope that makes sense. All right, yeah, Nicholas, no, is that not work? a problem, John? It wasn't so much about my issue. It's just that it's one of those things that may come up, and some people that are not here for the tutorial, it's probably good for them to hear it on the recording. Yeah, thank you. So, as as I've explained it, do you think that's workable within those constraints that you mentioned, Nicholas? Um, yeah, I believe so. As I said, uh, you get 40 minutes a session and um, Monique's pointed out that you can uh, you can start another session. But I think Zoom, if you have a free account, they limit it to two, possibly three sessions a day uh, and no more than that. So if you don't get it all done, you'd have to schedule with everybody else to do it on another day. So for those that are planning it out, give yourself plenty of time <laughs> to get to get those days in because everybody's got to organise them time to get together as well. All right. No, that's a really good point. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, and B's joined us. Hi, B. Are there any other questions or comments before we wrap up? All good? All right. Thank you very much for your patience tonight. Next week, we'll continue in terms of lots of practical issues. Um, but for the moment, keep at it. All right. All the best. See you then.